Good evening, I am a neurosurgeon and I am going to tell you a story. This is the story of Maxim. Maxim is a 10 years old child. He lives, he lives in a small village in the sub-Saharan Africa. He lives with his family and he has a dog named Baloo. This is a good village. They have also water, they have also a school and he loves to go to school and he enjoys writing, drawing and he hates math. Quite normal. And um, to go to school every day, Maxim crosses a very busy area. One day, a driver doesn't see him, doesn't notice him, and hit him. He loses consciousness because of a traumatic brain injury. His father transports him in a hospital 50 kilometers away, and he is very lucky because there is a hospital 50 kilometers away. And in that hospital, they have also a CT scan. And also for this reason, he is very lucky. They do an exam and they discover that Maxim has a brain hemorrhage. So he has a condition of intracranial hypertension. So he needs a urgent intervention. He needs a neurosurgical intervention. They need a neurosurgeon. But there are no neurosurgeons in that area. This is strange, this is crazy, but if we analyze some number, we discover that the ratio between neurosurgeons and population is very different around the globe. In Europe, we have one neurosurgeon per 60,000 people. In this area of the world, we have one neurosurgeon per 11 million of inhabitants. So it's crazy. But by the way, that day, Maxim will do the intervention. Dr. Assam is a general surgeon and he will do his best to help Maxim. So he will do an intervention, he will try to uh, drain the hematoma, uh, he will try to put some catheter inside, but unfortunately he, he is not a neurosurgeon, he, is not, he, he has no experience in, in, in such a, uh, this type of, of, of pathology, but he will do his best and trying is better than doing nothing. So during the intervention, Dr. Assam has another intraoperative hemorrhage. He tried to do his best. He has not enough experience and he has not enough automatism. He has not enough skills. He didn't train for this. And sadly, Maxim doesn't make it. Sorry, this is a very bad story, but this is the real story of 1.5 million of people which die each year because of the lack of safe surgeries. And just to give you a parallel, just to give you another idea, the victims for COVID were uh, 2.4 million since the beginning of the pandemic. But the difference here is that the first tragedy happens each year. So we do not understand this number until we do not experiment this number in our lives. So in, in, in the scientific community, we know very well this problem. And we call this problem global surgery. You don't even expect such a similar problem to exist, obviously, because our university created a lot of neurosurgeons, a lot of surgeons in general, and they form a lot of young residents each year. But wait they form aspiring surgeons. And these young guys will take at least 10 to 15 years to reach autonomy by spending at least 1 million during the entire career. And these crazy numbers cut off the low and middle income countries. So apart the problem of the lack of technologies, there is another huge problem, the lack of the most important technology, the surgeon. So what can we do? This is a huge problem, is a mind-blowing problem, is an, a very old problem. We are already at work. The entire scientific community uh, worldwide is working to find a solution. And we are working to create a new innovative solution. And the solution is to create a new generation of surgeons. We did a different way. We did a different training. 
Imagine a new generation of surgeons with incredible abilities, capable of performing extremely advanced and complex uh, discipline or, or advanced and complex uh, performances. And most important, imagine that these surgeons will be able to perform this type of complexities independently by the socio-economical conditions of their countries. Wow, this may be revolutionary, but how can we do that? We are using smart technologies. We are using soft-edge technologies based for simulation. And this new generation of surgeons is, is starting a, a new era in surgery. We are going to, uh, to, 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 to make possible an incredible thing. They will uh, acquire advanced skills in few months rather than years. I say it again, they will acquire advanced skills in few months rather than years. It sounds quite crazy, but we are already doing it. But how this is possible? We started analyzing the skills. To do surgery, we need mental skills, and we need manual skills, and we need to coordinate all these skills together. So we started doing the first studies and the first experiences, and we are conducting, conducting these studies in the University of Milan and in my hospital, Humanitas Research Hospital uh, in Milan. Uh, and these studies has, uh, have two, two different goals. The first goal is to analyze and to identify different profiles of abilities. So we are anali analyzing cortical activation, muscular uh, activation, we are analyzing hand-eye hand, uh, hand coordination of different levels of education, so older surgeons or young residents. And we are doing incredible discoveries. We are in, uh, discovering that it is possible to influence these abilities. So we are looking for new technologies, smart technologies to support that specific skills. One day, very soon, we will be able to manipulate human abilities. And this will be extraordinary. Imagine to condense years of experiences in months. And imagine to make these program, psychomotor training programs available at a global level. Wow. It can change many things and many lives. And imagine the, the, the skills of the, the best surgeons in the world transferred using these technologies to young surgeons. And this is not science fiction. We call this universe of psychomotor skill improvement methodology. So, but how this is possible? Uh, we are working on learning, so we need to come back to, to the basics. And to come back to the basics, I, I will do some example. If you are children, this example will be very clear. This is my family. This is the most important thing of my life, obviously. And with Ari, every day we see Francesco running around uh, and, 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 and learning many things. Uh, new things that the day before he didn't do. So it's like something very new every day. And in these days, Francesco is experimenting going downstairs. And in the beginning, he, he, he threw his feet in at a random while looking down. And after a while, his mind started understanding. And now he's able, in an automatic way, to coordinate his movements. And what is happening? In his mind, he's creating connections. So connections billions of connections every day. And I give you another example. Me. What about me? I am very talented in this. I can even jump the stairs. And am I better than my son by nature? Absolutely not. It's because I did this many times and thousands of times more and I have more connection than him. So the, the repetition of the experience straightens the connections, straightens the network. What is the neocortex? The neocortex is the most recent part of our brain in terms of evolution, and we cannot control everything. We cannot think everything. But when we start something new, we think each specific movement. After a while, we create deeper uh, networks, and we start using deeper structures. We start using our autopilots. So we have autopilots inside our brain. And we can talk about skills when a specific task becomes automatic. This is very well known in many disciplines. If you think, for example, me uh, music or, or sport, the key is the exercise. The key is the repetition. For example, a runner every day does his circuits and does his uh, or her uh, training 
uh, or uh, what, what does he doing? Uh, he is doing the simulation of the race. Or, for example, the pilot. Every day a pilot is required to do many hours of simulation, so he's simulating the flight. But what happens in surgery? And this is strange, because in surgery is completely different. The tradition in surgery is that, as I said, you need from 10 to, from 10 to 15 years to gain autonomy. Why? Because the tradition is that you enter and you start practicing in, in the OR at a completely random way. What does it mean? You need to be in the right place at the right time to access the experience, to have chance to, to experience. And the crazy aspect of, this, uh, of these things is that if you analyze different profiles of the two different residents of the same school, so the same countries, the same resources, they will be completely different. What we are trying to do is to introduce a new concept. Imagine to introduce on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, simulation in order to mix this with the real experience in the operatory room. This can change things. This is absolutely game changing. Why? Because we can improve our skills and we can avoid that the resident loses that improvement. I give you a practical example in surgery. I am a neurosurgeon and this is the way we open the skull. It, it is a craniotomy. So we use a high-speed drill. If you do not using, if you don't, do not use properly a high-speed drill, it becomes a weapon for you and for your patient. Okay, this resident, this young resident that morning did this procedure 15 times. In the same morning, he performed 15 craniotomies. And you say, and so what? Okay, in the tradition, this resident needed at least 15 cadavers and this is a problem in terms of cost so it, it is impossible or it, it needs for example 15 patients so 15 operation in the in a limited period of time and this is impossible so the other problem is the time between an experience and the other so the only one way to train your autopilot is to perform a specific procedure many times in a limited period of time and talking about pilot, I, I, I will give you another example, and this is a paradox. Imagine to be on a flight. You are hearing the pilot explaining uh, details about time arrival, about the weather, uh, and other things. And you are calm. You know perfectly that for a few hours your life will be on its end. And you are calm. Absolutely calm. Why? Because you take for granted that probably you imagine something like this uh, 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 a nice guy which is experienced enough and he did this procedure many times, and most of all, you take for granted that this is simulation based. So his career is simulation based uh, and he did certification with simulation. But what if the first pilot starts explaining that this time? the landing will be performed by a novice, a young student without experience. Probably you start imagining something like this and probably this may be your reaction in that moment. But wait, you accept this every day when you enter an operatory room as a patient. This is the tradition in surgery and you accept this. So this is a cultural paradox. Of course, we operate in a very different way. We did a lot of progresses in surgery and obviously many things changed if we compare to 100 years ago, but some concept is the, is the same. For example, we are required to operate as much as we can to gain talent, to, to gain uh, um, skills. This is good, this is right, but we are saying we can improve this. And how we can improve this? Generally, in the tradition, we use cadaver. This is a real brain, a formal and fixed human brain, and this is the experience in the cadaver lab. So we can access the real anatomy using this preparation, but this is very expensive, this is limited, and obviously in many countries, they cannot use cadavers also for religious, for, re for, for religious um, limits. So imagine if we may use advanced technologies to simulate the real 
organic aspect and, and features of a real brain. So this is what we are doing exactly now, and this is going to change many paradigms in, the, in education. And imagine to do this at a global level, imagine to do this accessible uh, everywhere and unlimited. I can give you many examples of incredible companies which are doing incredible things in terms of technology. And uh, if you consider the access to these technologies, we can say always the same thing. That uh, is that if, if, the more the complexity of these technologies improve, and the more obviously, uh, and the higher is the cost. And obviously, this is cutting parts of, of population. So uh, the problem in this case is that um, we are creating a gap between the, the, the few who can afford these technologies and the many who cannot. So this is not progress, this is the seed of progress. And what is progress in, in our opinion? The, progress, the real progress is when we are able to democratize a specific technologies. And this is what they did, for example, with cars. Ford, John Ford did this with cars. At some point of the, his, of the human history, cars became uh, available for the American families, for example. Or, or this is what mm, Apple did with personal computer, where we, they made personal computer available for anyone, everywhere. So just to conclude, this is the new generation. They are training on a very complex procedure, which is a clipping of a real, uh, almost real aneurysm. This is obviously a smart simulation. And they are very young and they are training in a very, in a, in a, in a, in a very new way. And this is a complex discipline and generally they cannot train these type of abilities in the real and traditional way, in the traditional life. And generally, uh, what they do in this specific simulation is not only about to train their hands, but also their minds and their emotions. So to link with the story of, uh, of Maxim, imagine these programs uh, exported everywhere in the world, and imagine a different ending in the story of Maxim. Imagine that Dr. Assam that day could use these automatism thanks to these smart technologies after a while, after a period of uh, intensive psychomotor training related, for example, to urgency in neurosurgery. And thanks to these skills, that day, Dr. Assam managed that bleeding. And after some week, Maxim came back home. Thank you.